can certainly appreciate part of the prayer uh, that Hank just led us in in uh, applying the word. And that's exactly why John was written. I want to continue to go back to that. John was written. These things were written down so that we may believe and in believing in His name we can have everlasting life. If you will go ahead and turn to John chapter 17 is where we'll be tonight. We want to back up just a little bit because I know that um, it's been about a week since we uh, have studied uh, John 16. and um, Now, John um, 14, 15, 16 is all kind of the same um, setting that we have. And whenever we get to John chapter 16, these things I have spoken to you so that you may keep from stumbling. So he's giving them some practical advice about how to not stumble because he knows what's about to happen and that is his time is at hand. It is almost time for him to leave and then what's going to happen? He leaves and who comes in? The Spirit comes. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in John chapter 17. Um, but whenever we uh, are talking about this, just remember it's very specific to these individuals. In John chapter 17, you can certainly see a, a very real and hard shift from just these people to us. And we'll, as we move through John 17, we'll see that. But he does say they're going to make you outcasts. He gives them warnings. They're going to make you outcasts uh, from the synagogue. We've already seen that already happening. We saw that in John 9 with the, with the blind man. We've seen that in numerous uh, little uh, blurbs here and there that, you know, they, they all feared because of the Pharisees that they'd be put out of the synagogue. Uh, don't profess his name. Um, and then he says, uh, an hour is coming for everyone who kills you will think that he's offering service to God. We, talk, we noted um, Saul of Tarsus. Um, you know, and we also noted some of the others also that said we're doing God's work by putting these men to death. As a matter of fact, we see the Jews think that they're doing God's work by doing what? Putting who to death? Jesus. And that's about to happen in just a few chapters. So, you know, the, the ark is kind of, we're getting to the very top of the ark of this uh, story that um, of, of the Son of God. And then in verse uh, 4, he says, But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. At the time John was written, what was going on in John's life? Prison. Prison. We had some persecution. What else? We know in Revelation... What was going on in Revelation? He was in Patmos. Why was he there? He was in exile. So Jesus is, and that's why he writes this in here. Aha! This is what Jesus was talking about. These things I've spoken to you, so when they, when their hour does come, you will remember that I told you of them. So he is being reminded currently while he's writing of those things that Jesus said was going to happen. He also tells them to take heart um, I know that your heart is uh, filled with sorrow, but in verse 7, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go, for if I do not go, the Helper will not come. So I'm doing my Father's work, and at some point in time, it will be your turn to do the Father's work and for what He has uh, set out for you to do. And we know much later on in the story, specifically whenever we get to reading the book of Acts and later on, what their work actually was. And that was to to um, spread the word of the gospel, spread the word of the kingdom, and to help organize the church as well into the way that it, it should be. Um, we also know they had a very specific role. Um, we mentioned um, you know, there are certain offices that, that uh, the church has, and apostles are one of them. They are part of that. They wrote these things down so that we may believe. And uh, we see this not only in the book of John, but also in 1 John. We read this also in 1 John chapter 1. Um, and he says in verse 12, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. So he's kind of unloading a lot on them. And can you imagine, you know, you're going to be persecuted. I'm going away. The helper's coming. There's a lot more to the story. You're just not able to handle it right now. And I would probably agree with Jesus 
if I were one of them because this is a very heavy load that he's putting on, on them. Um, and then he goes on to say in verse 20, Truly, truly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will grieve, but your grief will be turned into joy. We talked a lot about that and the image that Christ use, uses with the, um, with the woman who is giving in childbirth and um, how that's not the first time that's been mentioned, but uh, it is mentioned later on as well. Uh, and earlier in some of the Old Testament uh, scriptures. It also says in verse 25, these things I've spoken to you in figurative language, and hour is coming, I'll no longer speak to you in figurative language, but will tell you plainly of the Father. And so he's moving on from all of these uh, parables and, and using figurative language, he's moving more towards being very spoken to them and just telling them, I'm going to die. And, uh, and they actually say that in verse 29, we see now that you are speaking uh, plainly and not using a figure of speech. Um, so we know all, we, uh, now we know you know all things and have no need for anyone to question you by this. We believe that you came from God. And so it is by his words now that he's speaking that they actually believe. He doesn't really mention, we know that you're the Son of God because of the signs and the wonders and the miracles that you do, but because of the words that you speak. And we uh, spoke about that in um, their, you know, when you have the Samaritan woman and all of Samaria came out there and they believed because of the words that he spoke. We, Believe because of what you said, but now because we've heard him, now we believe that this is the Son of God. But yet you have the Jews with all of these signs and wonders still struggling with their belief. He goes on, and we talked a little bit about this at the very end. In uh, uh, verse 31, Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? So that's where you currently are. And then in verse 32, Behold, an hour is coming and has already come for you to be scattered, each to his own home, and to leave me alone, and yet I am not alone because the Father is with me. These things I've spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you're going to have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. And it doesn't stop there. I mean, chapter 17 just kind of picks up from that. And so that's kind of the context in which John 17 sits. Any questions or comments about John 16. Alright, let's move on to John 17. Jesus spoke these things, and then lifting His eyes up to heaven, He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify Your Son, so that Your Son may glorify You, even as You gave Him authority over all flesh, that to all whom You have given Him, He may give eternal life. Alright, so let's just kind of start right there with that statement and that John chapter 17 and verse 1 sounds very familiar to us. And why would it sound familiar to us? Father, the hour has come. Do you remember the first miracle that we spoke about? And that was Jesus turning the water into wine. And when Mary asked Him, you know, to help, what does He say? My hour has not come. And throughout the book of John, if you will highlight every time you kind of see that or a variation of that, my hour has not come, my hour has not come, we start to kind of make a transition that the hour has now come. And we also see in John chapter 16 what we just said um, in uh, verse uh, 4, 16 verse 4, but these things I've spoken to you so that when their hour comes. So that hour has not come for them, but it will in the future. But he does say in verse 1, Father, the hour has come. It is now time. And what time is it? What is the hour that he's talking about? He's going to be taken. I'm sorry, what? Taken and crucified. And what's that going to do for the Father? It will glorify the Father. Now, we spoke a little bit about this in uh, some of the previous chapters that he says, I go to lay down my life. If I didn't lay down my life, people wouldn't believe that I am the Son of God. So if he goes kicking and screaming and why, no, don't let this happen, is he obeying the Father? 
No. So this has to be something that he is resolved in every fiber of his being to go to that cross. And he knows it's happening. That's, you know, for us, if we know how we're going to die, we, we really want to know, I guess. And if we did, and you knew you were going to die on a cross the way that he was, would you be looking forward to that? Uh, he's just, the hour has come. And I am going to glorify your, you, uh, and you glorify me. And then he says in verse 2 that um, even as you gave him authority over all flesh, that to all whom you have given him he may give eternal life. Now we're going to read that. Uh, the um, we're going to read a lot about eternal life in John chapter 17. It's mentioned a couple of times throughout this, uh, this prayer that he's giving the Father. Um, and then he describes what he sees as eternal life in verse 3. This is eternal life. That they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, that's how you come to eternal life is you come to know the Father and you come to know the Christ. You can't have one without the other. And the reason for that is because of truth. And we're going to read that here very shortly. Now, it's important that we understand that because that's where unity is. It is in truth. And we see here in that unity and in that truth is where eternal life lies. In verse 4 it says, I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work which you have given me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, with the glory which with you, um, with you before the world was. So he is placing himself squarely with God at the beginning of time. So he's saying that it's time now for every one of the Godhead to be glorified. And through this act that he is going to go through, this, um, this sacrifice. Um, but as we look back at this eternal life, and this is eternal life that they may know you. So we've already stated that if Christ obeys to the point of death, and he's not kicking and screaming and all that kind of stuff, if he obeys to the point of death, people should believe that he is the Son of God. That is the... the um, the mark of that, and the fact that we also see that um, now he is, uh, the hour has come, and that's what's going to bring about eternal life is that obedience. All right, and now the question comes in Does Christ's sacrifice give eternal life to everyone? Opportunity? Okay, do I? The ones that. Obey him to, you know, follow, to obey the gospel. You can't. It's not automatic. Uh, right. Yeah. You have to obey. All right. But what do we see is the qualifier here that you that they may know you. So you have to come to know God, and there's only one way to do that. How do we know about the Holy Spirit? What you have in your laps. That's how you know it. How do you know about Jesus Christ? Through this. That's why John was written. So all of these things, we're starting to see the power of the Word that we have here, that you have in your laps. And we see in verse 6, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world, they were yours and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. So he gives them credit for what they have done. Up to that point, they have been obedient. Now, were they confused a lot of times? Yeah, because that's the way life is sometimes. And that's the way the uh, Christian life is also. You know, just trying to train ourselves to be able to discern right and wrong and what is the right thing to do. And when is it best to do this? And when is it best to do that? You know, do we mercy, 
judgment? What is it that, you know, what, where's that balance at? So, you know, some of those things that, you know, we struggle with, they most certainly uh, struggle with, but I want you to understand at the very end, the reason that I kind of went over that four, five, and um, three, four, and five, uh, in the fact that it's about the word is because that's what he says. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. He goes on to say, now they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. They understand that you sent me. They understand that the power in which I have to do these miracles, these signs, these wonders, and the authority that I have to speak, they know it is from me. So they know me, therefore they know the Father. They have eternal life is what he's saying. And he goes on to say, um, for the words which you gave me, again, how powerful is that? The words which you gave me, I have given to them. And they received them and truly understood that I came forth from you and they believed that you sent me. So he is certainly kind of talking to the Father here about these men. And they obeyed the Word of God. They listened to the Word of God. And now they're going to retain the Word of God and then they're going to be able to spread it later on. But we see the power of what we're talking about in the Word. And it is not by signs and miracles and wonders and stuff like that, but what we see is the words that God has spoken. He's spoken through His Son. And we read that in Hebrews. Um, you know, in these latter days, He has spoken to us through His Son. So we're, that's what we're learning now. And we also see that these men that have been with Him have obeyed those words. All right, any questions, comments? Go ahead, Stephen. As he's talking about this here, one of the ones that's included in his description is Nathaniel, who back at the beginning of the book was like, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Right. And he explained to him, you know, because, because I told you that I saw you earlier, you, you, know, you believe you're going to see greater things, and here's kind of this summary of it. They've been with me this whole time. I've taught them. I've trained them. Witness they observe, and they are where they need to be right now. We understand that they waver over the next right. few days, but they don't fall. Right, they're still there because of what they've seen. Yeah, and you know, and I and I truly believe also is the practical application that they probably made within themselves. You know, whenever the the teaching goes on um, with the Sermon on the Mount, you know, you have to learn to apply those things they have to the words have to come off the page and you have to learn to live those words and so and I think that whenever we see that they have obeyed and they have kept your word that's what we're talking about Go ahead. and Nathaniel is sort of the representative like Thomas is here yeah. a little bit later that you know, these these men are not just gullible um, you know they're going to believe anything they ever see or hear um, they're, they're not going to be fooled or bamboozled. They, they are rational, reasonable men who have their own skepticisms and concerns and things like that. But yet, spending this time with him, it is trans. It, at least the process of transforming them has begun. And as he's explaining here, they believe him. They believe he's from the Father. They've accepted what he said. They're beginning to get this. Right. And uh, again, understanding that Christ can even look into the mind and know, and this is what He says about them. So, anything else? All right. Um, if you will, please turn to. Well, you don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll read it if you don't want to. Second uh, Peter chapter one. Um, this was a cross reference I had. Second Peter chapter one. Um, and this was a cross, cross reference I had in verse 3 and this is eternal life um, and that they know you the only true God and there's a lot said just whenever he says true God there's a lot of referencing that goes on there but um, in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 3 his divine power has granted us to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory 
and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. And in verse 3 of 2 Peter chapter 1, um, what we see is His divine power has granted to uh, us all all things that pertain to life and godliness. And it says, through the knowledge of Him who called us. And so, that's exactly what we see here happening in John chapter 17. They know all things and or all things are going to be um, given to them that pertain to life and godliness. That's what Christ says here about them, that they have eternal life and it's because of the, you know, they believe. And we also see something, <clears throat> excuse me, something else in this is that it is only through the knowledge of Him that that happens. Um, all right, moving on down. I don't want to keep backing up too much. Um, but in verse 9, I ask on their behalf. And so it shows that there is an intercession that we can have on behalf of others. Um, and he says, I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all things that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep them in your name, the name which you had given me, that they may be one, even as we are. There's a lot kind of packed in there. Now, um, what we see is, first of all, he is praying on their behalf. Now, why would he need to pray on their behalf? <laughs> Everybody's going, <laughs> really? The thing that's going to happen, they'll need the strength and the knowledge. What kind of question? They're going to need some perseverance. I mean, you know, and and he's warned them. In John 16, we see him warning them about the things that are about to come. So why don't they just say, well, you don't need to pray for them. We've already warned them. They know what's going to happen. Well, he kind of said, he's also setting an example for us to know that we need to pray for one another. Yeah. Because he knows that we need to pray for Very good. Very good. Yeah. Life is hard. You got to have God, you know, in order to make it through. You got to have each other also, and the prayers of one another as well. Very good. Um, so, what's all this? Mine is yours. Yours is mine. And what's all that language? He's talking about these men who are devoted to him, and devoted to the Father. They belong to him belong to the Father, which is just all through this section that that unity between the Father and Son and and how these disciples were viewed belonging to both of them. Correct. Um, and then that they through them that's how the Father then will be glorified. He talked about this glorify the Son, the Son will glorify you, and now he's talking about they're going to glorify me. And honor me. So he's he's praying for them as we've said. They're getting ready to be hit by a freight train. And they they never imagined what would actually unfold, what was about to come. And he's he's praying that they're going to be, as you said, steadfast through that because you you've got the man that they depend on all this time who's not going to be there for them. They have to take up that mantle of leadership. You know. A very difficult task he's asking of them. But they're ready for it. And I think that's, you know, his encouragement to them is take courage. It's going to be hard, but you, you can do this. And um, in, in all of this, I also see this idea of unity. What's mine is yours. What's yours is mine. And, you know, uh, specifically these particular men, um, they're going to need some protection from the evil one. Because already we've already stated about like whenever Peter says, "Well, I, I would die for you," and he says, "Well, Peter, just let me tell you something. You're going to deny me three times." And he also, in in other uh, places, he says that Satan has asked for permission to do what? 
sift you as your your wheat and tears and you know, and I pray for you. So, you, you know, whenever we see this, uh, this kind of language, what we see is a true understanding of what unity looks like. And that is all things are common amongst them, specifically talking about these men. Um, they need to be uh, protected. They need your protection because of what's about to undergo. I'm leaving them. The helper's coming. But they still need protection. Um, we also see... Uh, in verse 11, I am no longer in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. So they're still going to be here. After all is said and done, uh, they're still going to be there. In verse 12, while I was with them, I was keeping them in your name, which you have given me, and I guarded them, and not one of them perished, but the son of perdition, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Who is that son of perdition? Judas, the one that's missing now. And there was a reason that there was a son of perdition. And he says, so that what? So that the Scripture may be fulfilled. And um, we also see, so this was long ago that this was already um, being stated about there would be one. And we see that out of, out of the uh, 11 there, who all has he uh, kept? The 11 he is kept. He's kept guarded and safe. And then he goes on, But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, so that they may have joy, <clears throat> may fall in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, let's talk a little bit about what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. So, because that's what he says in verse 11, uh, yet they themselves are in the world. But when you turn to um, verse 14, he says the world has hated them because they are not of the world. So, what's the difference? Why? Did, what, what kind of language is he using here and why does he use it? Well, we live in the world, Mike, but we do not partake in the worldly lust and things of that nature that we that the word that God's word tells us to stay away from. Didn't we at, at some point in time though partake in those things? At one time, but we chose to return from those things and follow. Okay. So me just doing something opposite of what I did is what he's talking about here. Go ahead, Glenn. This is the definition of holy. So you now become set apart. You're not removed. You're set apart for it. So then when he goes down into verse 17, he says, sanctify them by your truth. That's the same idea. Set them apart. Go ahead and be holy because the Father, you are holy. Yeah, the, and, I, and I bring that up because there's this idea of if you have a good moral compass, you're all of a sudden saved. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean. If you have someone who was a drug addict and they don't become a drug addict, or they stop you know, uh, doing drugs, does that make them saved? It doesn't make them holy. It doesn't make them saved. But we could say they're cleaning up their lives or whatever. Go ahead, Stephen. The, the motivation for some people to change their behavior is either uh, peer pressure, cultural ideas, or there's their personal pain of experience, so they decide, well, I need to reform my life, I need to do better, it's causing me problems. Whereas the Bible tells us the reason we need to change our behavior is because we love God. That's godly sorrow. I, I have to recognize I've offended God. Right. That's that's where the problem is. Yes. Um, as David said, you know, it's you, you only have my sin. Um, we have to have that frame of reference. And then, as you're saying, the submission to the Lord and His ways, and that's going to set us apart from the world when the world demands conformity. That's why they hate us, right. because we will not conform. Well, you know, and I think that we're also, we, it would behoove us to look at John chapter 3 again also, that there's a new birth that has to happen. 
And so therefore, that new birth happens and Nicodemus is very confused by it. Am I supposed to enter my mother's womb and come out again? No, that's not what I'm talking about. I am talking about a new birth, a spiritual birth. That way, you are not of this world. You may be in the world, but you're not of this world. And there are people, you know, whenever we're born, we're born of the world. However, a new spiritual birth happens. And we also see something else, and I think that you alluded to this, in 1 Peter chapter 3, if you want, we'll go ahead and turn there. I know it's one that we are very familiar with. 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll start in verse... Um, Let's start in verse uh, 13. Who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. But, in verse 15, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and reverence and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which they in which you are slandered those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame for it is better if God should will it so that you should suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong now all of that stuff is because we are sanctifying Christ in our hearts the very next verse says this Verse 18, for, God, for Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that He might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. It is a new birth. And then in verse 19, in which he also made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient with the patience of God, kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that. So you see the context in what verse 21 sits in. It is talking about a new birth. It is talking about those souls who were completely drowned out with the exception of eight souls that followed God. That water separated Noah and his family from what? Destruction. From destruction, from the wrath of God. It separated him from the world of sin. And it was a whole brand new beginning for everything. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who is at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to Him. Now notice what he says about having a good conscience. If you'll back up to verse 16 and keep a good conscience. And he says that, that you do that by sanctifying Christ in your hearts. In other words, what is on the inside, the outside should reflect. But we see that just as Noah was separated by sin, by water, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. It separates you from sin. Alright, and I turn back to John chapter 17 so that we can kind of understand what all we're talking about here. And that is there has to be a new birth. There has to be at some point in time that the birth happens. And where does it happen? When one sanctifies one uh, Christ in his heart and he obeys Christ and follows him through baptism. And there are so many other scriptures that we could turn to. I think this will suffice for what we're talking about. But what we see here in John chapter 17, and we're and Clint's right, we're about to see something else about sanctification and where it comes from. And he says in verse, uh, 
if we, we backed up in verse uh, 14, I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but to keep them from the evil one. So that's the protection that he's asking for. And then he says, they are not of the world, even as not I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So that's where sanctification happens. That's where it starts. And you can see what Christ thinks about them because he says that they've obeyed the word of God. Go ahead. But he's also praying for us, I think. We'll get to that. I'll, I'll get to that. In verse 17, though, we see, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. And so, just as we are supposed to sanctify Christ in our hearts, how does that happen? We just have lovey good dovey feelings, or how does it? I don't know. You know, you have to tell me. Sanctified in His word, which is the truth. Separated out in our hearts. I mean, you know, it's something special to us. Go ahead, Stephen. It's essentially a firm conviction that Christ is our Lord, not not just a, a mental ascent, but that we we actually live. Right. That He He directs our lives. Right. Yep. Anything else? In verse eighteen, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. Now, what was He sent to the world to do? To give his life, but to also show who the Father was. Right? And how did he do that? A lot of signs. signs, wonders, miracles, the way that he lived, the teaching that he did. And just as I've been sent out to the world, I am sending these men out to the world also. And he says in verse 19, for their sake, for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Now, what Joe pointed out is that hard break that I was talking about. And that is, who has he been praying for? Apostles. For the apostles, for those men that he has around them. And then in verse 20, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word. You, me, people who read the Scriptures, who can understand the Scriptures, who want to be part of this. Because he goes on to say, and as we kind of read previous to that, this idea of what's mine is yours and what's yours is mine and we're all one and they're all one with us, Notice what he says about these people who will believe me, uh, believe him through their word. Verse 21, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. That's why it's important that we are unified. That's why it's important that we study, that we all come to the commonality of truth. And that we understand that the cross is the great equalizer of mankind. And the Word of God teaches us these things. And it is important that we are unified. That we show oneness. And if you look that word up, one, in the Scriptures, it is all throughout the Scriptures. And I know that there may be some comments about that, so I'll kind of open it up. <clears throat> All right. So where else does John kind of talk about this? Anybody know? If you read 1 John, it is completely and totally dedicated to this idea of fellowship and oneness. Go ahead and turn to 1 John. So obviously what was being stated here and that is those things be written down so that others may believe later on in the future was extremely important to the Apostle John. Because again, he doesn't just write about it here in John. I mean, he even says, I wrote the whole book so that you would believe. But in 1 John, it, he continues on, and I know that we have read this before, but it's important to see this, 
In verse 5, this is the message we have heard from Him and announced to you that God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, what words here have we just been reading here in John? What's some of the key words that we're reading? Sanctified and truth. Sanctified, truth, word. Fellowship. Fellowship. Mm -hmm. Exactly. In verse 7, if we walk in light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. That's how that happens. Now, it's important to understand what this fellowship is. Is he saying, talking about anything physical? Well, it's a spiritual fellowship. We are of the same mind. Correct. And who determines this fellowship? Do we? Who determines what fellowship is? God does. And it is described to us here, if you're walking in the light as He Himself in the light, then we all have fellowship with one another. So that's the definition of fellowship. Walking in the light. Doing the things that God has told us to do. Now, somebody breaks off. They decide not to. Is it up to us to say they're still in fellowship? And the answer is no. It has been defined they are not walking in light. They are walking in darkness, so therefore they no longer have fellowship with you. And that's why it's important that we understand this concept because of the misconception of what fellowship is and in that, a misconception of what unity is as well. Unity is not just agreeing to disagree. Unity is agreeing on the truth which is absolute or else it's not true. It is an agreement to, um, to continue to follow truth and to uh, continue to understand that truth comes from the Word of God. So there is no variation in, um, in the truth. Anything else on that? And I point that out because, as Joe pointed out, he is now talking about us. Very specifically about us. Because these things were written down. Their word was written down. We believe because of what the apostles wrote. And because of their teachings. We also see in verse 22, The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. I and them you and me, that they may be perfected in unity so the world may know that you sent me and love them just as you have loved me. When he makes this statement about how the world will know that, that, that you sent me, do you see how important it is that we find and we search for that unity of faith? It's extremely important. What does the religious world look like? Does the religious world look like this today? Absolutely not. Let me ask you this. Bring the scope down a little bit. Does the Church of Christ look like this today? Some of us. Some? But not all of them. Bring it down a little bit more. This congregation. We strive for that. Bring it down a little more. What about you? The individual. That's where this is made and broken. If you are not striving for the truth and you're not striving for unity, that's where it starts to break down. It is up to you as an individual, just like it was up to 11 men here, to find that unity. So it is on me, it's on you. If we say that we're part of this, and yeah, I see myself in verse 20 there, well, then that means I have a certain obligation to the person next to me as well and to the congregation, which makes for a better universal church. And I mean, it just 
it continues to roll from there. What we see in the world is nothing but chaos. We should not have that here, but it starts with the individual. Any questions or comments? Okay, let's very quickly wrap this up. In verse 24, it says, Father, now listen to what he says here. This is his desire. I desire that they also, whom you have given me, be with me where I am, so that they may see my glory which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. So another prayer for them, that they will be where he is. And then in verse 25, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them, and will make it known, so that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. Now, the false teachings that go on about love in the religious world today is not found here. Just as the Father and the Son have love for one another, that's the type of love that you must have. And He even says that is His desire. That's what He want, wishes for. And I've made it known, uh, your name known to them, and will make it known, um, make it known, so that the love with which you love me may be in them, and I in them. That is the bond that keeps unity together. It certainly is not just a, a, a feeling that we have, but it is action that we take along with that. Any questions or comments? There's a lot of cross-referencing in John chapter 17 that we didn't go over. I you know, would suggest that you know, while you're going through uh, some of these, uh, or if, while you're going through John chapter 17 again, um, that you look at some of the cross-references that even he has in Psalms. Uh, there, there are some cross-references in Psalms. There's some in Proverbs. Gotcha. Um, and then also uh, in the New Testament, there's cross reference in the New Testament. A lot of the idea of what love is from 1 John is, is referenced here. So a lot of that is kind of in here. But we have to understand that the same love that they had we have to show to one another so the world may believe that Jesus actually did come here, die for us, and was ready to serve that. Go ahead. Here we have a beautiful and passionate prayer of our Savior as He is mere hours away to be tortured and crucified. He's thinking about these disciples. He's thinking about us in the future. And he's offering up this prayer to the Father. And one thing we can take part in, be comforted in, he subscribes our advocate before the Father. He is, he is before the Father now, pleading on our behalf for these types of things that we would be committed to him, that we would glorify him, that we would be united together as one to be a declaration to the world. Christ has come, he is the Savior. He, he continues to do what He's doing here. And so that should give us encouragement, should give us strength. He's mindful. He, he knew these men personally and intimately. He knew their strengths, their weaknesses, their fears, their joys. And he knows all that about us. And He's there for us just like He was there for them. Very good. Very good. It's good closing thoughts. We're going to close the class out with that. Thank you.